Don't you love this gospel where Jesus is the good shepherd and he calls the sheep by name? You know, it's like Fluffy, Snowball, Spike, Eddie, you know. You know. Okay, that, I thought that was really funny, but I guess <laughs> not so much. Um, let, let me try a second time. Okay, hold on. I've got, I've got to read this so I get it right. You can do this. Here we go. No, that's not it. Stop. Okay, good. It says, man goes to confession, complaining of hearing voices. He says, Father, Father, every day I hear a voice telling me how bad I am and chastising me for all the things I've done wrong in my life. Every day. Am I possessed? He says, no, you're just married. <laughs> okay, I... Remember, forgiveness is an important part in the church. That's an important thing here. It, it, with this, when Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, one of the things that we have to think about is what voices ga- grab our attention? You know, who, who do we listen to in life? What courses do we decide to take? And I was looking for um, what some of the wisdom from uh, some of our, our Protestant sisters and brothers, and I find this little article by Suzanne Benner. She's... Um, not a theologian, but she's written a couple books with regard to how to apply the Bible. Um, and so she says these two examples. One is Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1. It says, does not wisdom call out? Does not wisdom call out to us? Does not understanding raise her voice to us? And she says, two voices compete for our attention. One entices with dubious promises. Says so she says, and, and in Proverbs 9, it says, the voice of folly is loud. The voice of folly is seductive and knows nothing. So whoever is simple, let them turn in here. And to the person who lacks sense, you know, folly speaks. Now she says, wisdom, on the other hand, accurately describes reality. It says this in chapter 8, it says, listen. Wisdom says this, listen, I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true, for my lips detest lies and wickedness. So Suzanne says, two voices in Proverbs, wisdom and folly, represent two pathways in life. And in the Bible, over and over, Proverbs contrasts wisdom and wise people with folly and fools. She says, in my mind, I see neon signs flashing on the road to folly. Free, feels good, satisfaction guaranteed. She says, folly tells us to live for the moment, seek pleasure, and choose instant gratification. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. She says this, though, at first glance, the narrow path of wisdom doesn't look very appealing. Wisdom demands a humble heart, a soul that's willing to listen, patience, self-denial, and to put it into practice, hard work. If wisdom was easy, everyone would be doing it. You know, but it takes some discernment, doesn't it? It takes some discernment. Says, when we read Proverbs, we know that experience teaches us that the pain of discipline is actually much lighter than the pain of regret. The pain of discipline is actually much lighter than the pain of regret. And I certainly find that the older I get, I find that there are things that I've come to understand much better than I ever did when I was younger. And I regret the fact that I, I can't change what those choices were back then. They were, they were made, they were done. Sometimes they were done with the best of intentions you know, but perhaps they weren't always done wisely. I hope I'm not the only one who has these feelings as you get older, you know. And part of that, though, besides being some of the pain, the regret of aging, is that it still is an instruction. You know, we can learn, you know, from past mistakes rather than just simply swear by them, you know. Um, or, oh, over and done with, nothing I can do about that. You can say, you know, that didn't really work out well. Or, gee, I wish I hadn't done that. 
Um, but sometimes you can only do the best you can, and sometimes your best is not very wise. Sometimes your best is not very wise. And of course, life doesn't come with an instruction booklet. So we have to know we're going to make mistakes. One time, <laughs> when we were in a seminary a billion years ago, when we were young um, and, and knew everything, the, uh, <laughs> we were in class with some of our seasoned professors. And they were talking about confession. And we had to actually practice hearing confession. And the, the professor at Catholic University you know, would have a, a, a little, one of those little confessional you know, models where you have the kneeler and you have the screen. The screen comes up from the kneeler. And so he would be the, uh, the penitent. And, and he would pick people and go, OK, you're going to be the priest today. And we would get in there and you know, we'd studied moral theology. And, and you know, we had, by this time, we had had like almost 12 years of school. And uh, so the first thing he said was so beyond our comprehension. And he knew this was going to happen. So he said, are you still there, Father? You know, he was like, what do you say to that? You know, what, what kind of advice do you give? You know, the, uh... And so he says, look, you got to understand this. He says, you guys are going to make mistakes. Now, this was something quite different than what we were expecting for ourselves because we were studying to do the best job we could. You know, and we were eager and enthusiastic about trying to be the best we could. And what happened is, in that classroom, he reminded us of our own human frailty, you know, to not always know what's best at the time. And he says, look, you're going to marry people that should never be married. He says, you're going to give advice to people that's going to be completely wrong. You know, he says, and he gave us a couple other examples. And he said, but, you know, just remember that this is how it is. And I suspect that the same thing is true for everybody in life, unless they're truly so narcissistic they never think about somebody else. You know, so the pain and regret that comes to us when we find that perhaps we've not chosen the best way of acting, you know, could simply paralyze us and, and give us toxic guilt. Oh my God, so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad. You know, and it's like, you know, I'm no good. The, uh, but the reality is only one person is perfect, and that's the Almighty. That's God. All the rest of us are human beings, which means we have a heart to love with, but we don't always think, you know, things out. And sometimes it's the first time around, so you had nothing to judge it by. You know, the whole idea of it seemed like a good idea at the time, you know. Sometimes that's, that's the best we can do. And so the important part about the shepherd and the sheep and wisdom and folly is that sheep are herd animals, and they need somebody to lead them. Um, and they're very vulnerable. You know, they, they, they really don't have a whole lot of, you know, defense mechanisms. You know, but at the most, one, other, one sheep can do when the wolf is carrying the other one else go, What would you think of going to say, hey, he got Larry. You know, they, took, they took Fluffy, you know. So we need to have understanding and wisdom. And that's why this image of the good shepherd is so important. The one that's not in this, the one I really like so much, is it shows the good shepherd who was at a, looking over a cliff. And there's a cliff, and then there's a little ledge below the cliff, and there's some brambles. And there's a, a lamb that's sort of stuck in the brambles, and it can't possibly get up to the cliff. And the Lord Jesus is bending down, and with the crook and with an, an arm, he's kind of lifting the sheep back, you know, from the edge of oblivion. And so that's the kind of shepherd that we have. The, oh, I walk through the valley of death. I fear no evil, for God is with me. With your rod and your staff, you comfort me. You know, and it's not a rod to beat us. It's a rod to comfort us. And it was, the staff was a way, you know, to keep us from, you know, leaving you know, the wisdom and safety of the flock, and to realize that we all do much better together. So wisdom and folly. And the point is, you know, we know that the two voices calling out are two paths to walk, righteousness or wickedness. And Suzanne Benner says, this was familiar to Jesus' audience, but he shocked his listeners when he said, I'm the way. 
and the truth and the life. So many voices battle for our attention in life, but only Jesus in the scripture speaks the words of everlasting life. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. And Jesus, when he was tempted by Satan, you know, said, well, turn these stones into bread. You must be hungry after 40 days of fasting. And Jesus says, you know, it's not by bread alone that we live, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so in our humility and in our human frailty, we find that we need God for guidance. We need God for forgiveness. And we need each other as well. Because we're all in essentially the same boat. I know it's a mixed metaphor. You know, we're, if we get the sheep in the pasture and we have the people of God in the boat. But I just, it just seems more illustrative to me to say we're all in the same boat. You know, and if your side of the boat has a hole in it or a leak, you can't just go, oh, that's not on my side. You, too bad for you, you know. And don't try coming over here either, you know. We're all in the same boat. So these are some of the things that I think about when I think of Good Shepherd Sunday. You know, we need God, we need each other, we make mistakes, we fail. But it doesn't mean that God turns his back on us. And it also should, in some way, give us a sense of joy because, God, doesn't it feel great to be forgiven? Especially when, you know, we ourselves can't forgive ourselves, but somebody else is able to say, it's okay. You know, you get to start over. You know, this isn't held against you in perpetuity. Our God is a God of salvation and mercy and love. I often find myself, myself chagrined, shocked, dismayed at how picky the church can be when it starts addressing its own members. You know, as if some people are bigger sinners than others, and perhaps technically they are, but the reality is that Jesus hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes who were considered beyond the pale. You know, he went to people and said, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm going to have dinner at your house today, which was a sign of acceptance. And at least the suggestion was that Zacchaeus, as a wealthy man, was a thief. And as a tax collector, he was a traitor because he was working for the imperial government, Rome. And no one likes the tax person anyway. And Jesus says, just a minute, nobody else might like you, but, you know, I'm going to come to your house. Maybe that'll help. Because some, many, some people like me. And if I associate with you, maybe they'll say, this guy can't be so bad. And that's why the scribes and Pharisees went nuts. You know, this man eats with sinners, and he accepts them. And Jesus said, look, you know, don't you guys read the scriptures? Go and learn the meaning of the word. It is mercy I desire, not sacrifice. So while we offer the, the bread of life and the cup of, of salvation, you know, for our sins, part of what we have to be coming away from with that is the idea that, look, we're all up here on the altar. Every single one of us are up here with Jesus. You know, and it's that when we embrace his love, his mercy, you know, his forgiveness. And, and, and that, that's one of the wonderful things about coming to church because we often sing that song, all are welcome, all are welcome in this house, you know. The church would be a lot fill, filler, fuller. There'd be more people coming to church, you know, if when people thought of church, they didn't think of condemnation or judgment. But if they thought of acceptance and a welcome. Because one of the biggest problems in the world today for young and old is loneliness. You know, I'm on the outs. Nobody cares. You know, who, why, am I, why am I important to anyone? And the church, I believe, should be saying over and over and over again, God loves you. You know, why don't you come together with us? We'd be happy to sit with you and talk to you about God's love and mercy. Uh, we'll sing some songs, we'll share some food, you know, and we'll, we'll read the Bible together because we think we need all of those things. And I, I think if we did that, a lot of our big major problems would disappear. I was going to say more, but I think I've come to my end.